What happened to Star Wars? What happened to the magic, the adventure, the event that was the release of a new Star Wars film? Lines out the doors of the theater, fan theories, fan fiction, which spawned an extensive expanded universe. Look no further than the current sitting president of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy. George Lucas, creator of the Star Wars universe, was quoted back in 1994 in a reprint of Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the first ever publication and installment of the Star Wars Expanded Universe, written by Alan Dean Foster. Lucas states the following, After Star Wars was released, it became apparent that my story, however many films it took to tell, was only one of thousands that could be told about the characters who inhabit its galaxy. But these were not stories I was destined to tell. Instead, they would spring from the imagination of other writers, inspired by the glimpse of a galaxy that Star Wars provided. Today, it is an amazing, if uninspected, legacy of Star Wars that so many gifted writers are contributing new stories to the saga." End quote. I think this quote is a good illustration for how George Lucas felt about the Expanded Universe. He did give permission for the creation of the Expanded Universe and Lucasfilm tried to maintain continuity between the EU and the films. However, Lucas himself didn't consider them canon. He generally ignored them when it came to the making of his films, however, there are small pieces he did draw from, such as the naming of the planet Coruscant, which was provided by author Timothy Zahn in Heir to the Empire. This is actually a much more complicated issue than I'm making it appear here, as there are actually different tiers of canon, G canon being George Lucas's films, T canon which is television canon, C canon which is what we call legends, a vast collection of books, games, comics, shows, what have you, all approved by Lucas, however he was never bound to them in the making of his films, and N canon which is non-canon. This would imply that it's not technically correct to refer to the expanded U as non-canon as they fill gaps in the stories and were licensed works. They were just licensed works that George Lucas was not bound to when making his films. Licensed fan fiction, if you will. That doesn't mean they couldn't be adapted into films when Disney bought Star Wars back in 2012, and this is why I bring this up. Kathleen Kennedy was appointed president of Lucasfilm back in 2012 when it was sold to Disney. Kennedy being placed as the new head of Lucasfilm was no surprise as she had worked with Lucas in the past on Indiana Jones and was an accomplished producer. George wanted his company to be in the hands of someone he trusted and Kennedy's history with Lucas alongside many of his friends such as Steven Spielberg made her a good choice, or so it seemed. The job of producer is generally the making of big decisions, hiring writers, hiring a director, securing the rights to a script, sourcing funding from investors and various studios, making a project happen, putting the right people in the right places so that the creative aspects of the project can run like a well-oiled machine. This is not to say that producers don't have to be creative themselves, but it is certainly not a requirement for the job, having the right connections in Hollywood is probably a much more applicable skill or benefit to this sort of work, and Kathleen Kennedy certainly had the right connections. She's worked for, and later with, Steven Spielberg on a number of productions such as Raiders of the Lost Ark and Poltergeist, received her first producer credit on box office hit E.T. The Extraterrestrial, worked with Lucas on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, produced the Back to the Future trilogy with her own production company, Amblin Entertainment, and this is just her early career, her credits and accomplishments in Hollywood are numerous and she certainly worked both for and with the right people to set herself up for future success. So why is it that I think Kathleen Kennedy is to blame for the current state of Star Wars? Well, let's start with her doing her job as a producer, speaking in her own defense toward the failure of Solo, a Star Wars story. Kennedy has been quoted as saying, quote, every one of these movies is a particularly hard nut to crack. There's no source material, we don't have comic books, we don't have 800 page novels. We don't have anything other than passionate storytellers who get together and talk about what the next iteration might be." End quote. Just let that sink in a bit. Quote, there is no source material, we don't have comic books, we don't have 800 page novels. End quote. 
This statement alone proves how little Kennedy knows about Star Wars. Multi-season animated shows, more than 300 published novels, over 100 video games, and thousands of comics. Someone who knows so little about the property shouldn't be allowed to run it. Someone who knows this little about the property shouldn't be allowed to source various scripts to determine who will head up the making of Star Wars films. Longtime fans have been getting invested in Legends for the last 40 years. And in either her failed attempts to pander to an audience of those unfamiliar with Star Wars, or her general lack of knowledge about the property, she put the wrong people in the wrong places. Kennedy proves time and time again she has a deep misunderstanding of what Star Wars actually is, and especially what it means to fans, by placing people in creative roles who, you guessed it, don't understand what Star Wars is. J.J. Abrams, for example, who worked on the sequel trilogy films 7 and 9, tried to make Lost in Space. And no, I don't mean the 1965 TV show Lost in Space, I mean the show Lost, which J.J. Abrams created, but in the Star Wars universe. Mystery box after mystery box, shallow characters, unsatisfying answers to the questions the mystery box is posed. See, in Empire, fans weren't waiting to find out who Luke's dad was. Fans weren't theorizing as to who Luke's dad was. Fans knew he was a Jedi and a pilot and that he had died, and that was enough. So when Darth Vader revealed to Luke that he was indeed his father, fans were shocked. They didn't need to wonder who his father was just to get them to show up to the next film. They showed up because it was good. J.J. Abrams' contribution to the sequel trilogy really was a lot like Lost, where you're kind of intrigued because you want to know what the hatch is or the smoke monster, but when you finally discover the answer, you're left feeling like the writers were just making it up as they went along. When Rey was revealed to be a Palpatine, you sort of get those same vibes. Rey Finn left the Stormtroopers because reasons, Poe is awesome because we're told he's awesome, and that's just that. Rey decides to drop everything and go become a hero because reasons, and has virtually no internal conflict throughout the entirety of the trilogy. Shallow characters. And that's what Star Wars is all about, the characters. Sure, it's an adventure, a space epic, but good character makes a good story. People we can identify with. And don't even get me started on Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi, a fundamental misunderstanding of the characters that he was charged with writing into a film. The wrong people in the wrong places. I tend to believe what happened with Rogue One was dumb luck, quite possibly the best thing to come out of Disney Star Wars since their acquisition of the IP. See, when you purchase the rights to a major IP like Disney did with Star Wars, Netflix with The Witcher, Amazon with Lord of the Rings, and so on, you are doing so on the assumption that you can profit off the name, you can make a movie and slap Star Wars on it and fans will show up because fans like Star Wars. But here's the thing, you're investing in the fandom. It's all well and good to hope that people who weren't fans of the IP beforehand will show up to your movie, that's what marketing is for. But to pander to that group of people instead of the fans you invested in is a recipe for disaster. It's become the new norm to criticize fans when a movie or film does poorly. Amazon's The Rings of Power is a perfect example of this. The show was ruthlessly bashed online because it spits in the face of Tolkien and doesn't honor the lore. However, higher-ups at Amazon and numerous news outlets wrote articles speaking about the racist and sexist nature of Tolkien fans. How we couldn't accept a leading lady, or black elves, or black dwarves, what have you. Which isn't the case at all, we couldn't accept Rings of Power because it was an absolute travesty to the world Tolkien created, and had little to do with the casting and far more to do with the story. However, this is the way it seems as Star Wars fans have been referred to as toxic and difficult when in reality, they're just passionate. See, Disney has become a company of activism, remaking their beloved animated films of the past to pander to what they refer to as more modern audiences. The addition of 15 male heroes slash villains in Marvel Phase 4 five of which are deceased, and the addition of 27 female heroes slash villains, none of which deceased. Credit to Nerd Roddick for doing the math on that. Getting into a legal battle with the state of Florida that all began with Disney's vocal opposition to a certain Florida bill proposed by a certain Florida governor. Taking a very open stance in terms of political and social issues, not only in their shows and films, but in the real world as well. 
And this may be all well and good, I don't want to get political here, however, regardless of how you feel about those sorts of issues, when you take a side on these sorts of things, you tend to make people angry. You tend to alienate a good portion of the audience who doesn't feel the same way. There are fundamental ideals of good and evil that stand the test of time and that are generally recognized across all cultures of the world. But this doesn't apply to all modern social issues. These sorts of things tend to be pretty divisive. To give a fairly simple example, take Mulan. The original film was about a young woman who disguised herself as a man so that she could protect her family by taking her father's place when he was conscripted into the military. She's not as strong or as skilled as the other men in her company, so she has to use her wit and cunning to outperform them. She also has to work really hard in her training so that she can hold her own and slowly becomes a force to be reckoned with. She's not the best or the brightest, but her bravery and strong will allows her to persevere. Now take the modern 2020 remake of Mulan. The film begins basically the same way, but when Mulan joins the military in her father's stead, she's better than the boys at everything, and I mean everything. So good at fighting, in fact, that she has to actually hold back her abilities just so that she doesn't get found out. And that's basically the gist of it. It's easy to see what Disney is trying to do here. They're trying to say, look, girls are just as good as boys, see? And that's all well and good, but at what cost? At the cost of a good story? Late 90s Mulan is a relatable story. It teaches us that with a strong will and perseverance, you can overcome adversity. Work hard and you will succeed. A very important lesson, especially with children. Modern Mulan, on the other hand, teaches a very different lesson. You're good at stuff already. Hard work is for losers. Women are better than men because reasons and just accept it. At a fundamental level, I suppose what they tried to do is okay, I guess. Girls are just as good as boys. Okay, fine. But by remaking this beloved classic, they actually made it worse. They taught us nothing. It's a form of representation at the cost of good story. And there are countless examples of this, especially with big companies like Disney. Women can no longer be the damsel in distress because that's a harmful message. Men can't be too heroic or too capable because that's toxic masculinity. A society of men and women in a fantasy world has to have people of all different races and colors because God forbid there be a little cultural heritage even in a fantasy world. These aren't harmful ideas inherently, but they form an ever-present agenda when it comes to modern storytelling and tend to sacrifice good story as a result of this incessant need to pander to the Hollywood agenda. You end up with a protagonist like Rey, heroic, brave, capable, a total boss at using the Force even though she's had no formal training. Rey Skywalker. There's no growth there. Say what you will about the prequel trilogy, but Anakin's fall from grace was methodical. He trained for years under one of the greatest Jedis of all time. We saw him go from rash and cocky in Episode 2 to a powerful, well-respected Jedi in Episode 3. He honed his abilities. We also saw some deep internal conflict in Anakin at the thought of losing his wife and his inability to save her, which made for good storytelling. Rey, on the other hand, had no internal conflict. She was actually so straightforward and bland that it almost seemed like something had to give, but it never did. She was just good. Good at everything. Good person, never questioned herself and this made for a bland character and a bland story. Kennedy's attempts to win over an audience of people who had no interest in Star Wars to begin with only ended in her alienating the fans she already had. In reference again to her attempts at damage control for Solo, a Star Wars story, Kennedy stated that she had learned from her mistakes and should never recast a core role. This is a famously bad take from Kennedy as it once again goes to show that not only does she not understand Star Wars, but she can't even learn the right lessons from her mistakes. She was certain that the box office failing was due to the fact that she recast Han Solo, not the fact that we didn't need an origin story for a character who already had an origin. She didn't learn when and how to kill off characters. She didn't learn that fan service isn't always a good thing, especially the way they did it. But the number one lesson that Kennedy has failed to learn in her time as president of Lucasfilm is don't bite the hand that feeds you. Don't insult the fans, whether it be verbally or in the form of stories you choose to greenlight. The male audience that you dislike so much has been around for a long time. They've watched some of the shows, they've maybe played some of the games, they've possibly read a number of the written works such as the comics or the novels. 
But most importantly, they pass their love of Star Wars onto their children. But instead of adapting some of the more popular stories and legends, Kennedy decided to let her creative juices run wild. Yet she has neither the talent nor the skill to facilitate a Star Wars story that resembles that of George Lucas. See, fan service is mostly a good thing if done correctly. And Disney did purchase Star Wars for the purposes of making money. The fans were already there, and we didn't ask for much. But what we got was an insult. In her attempts to pander to the Hollywood agenda and an audience of people who weren't interested in Star Wars to begin with, she waved bye-bye to her loyal fans. There have been a few gems hidden amongst the trash that is Disney Star Wars, Rogue One and Andor to name quite possibly the only two. But with shows like Obi-Wan poking holes in the original films, or the Boba Fett show which was so boring I couldn't even get through it, the damage has been done, and I'd be surprised to see Kennedy and Disney Star Wars come back from the mess they've made. The Star Wars fandom has been labeled the Fandom Menace for their harsh critiques of modern Star Wars projects. But I tell you now, my fellow fans, we are not a menace. We have not been too harsh. Perhaps we have not been harsh enough. What Disney has done to Star Wars and other IPs they've shamelessly bought up and ruined is a travesty. Stay vigilant. I really love making these videos, and I'd like to keep making them, so please subscribe and like the video. Thank you for watching.